Hello everybody, Pillar CCG here, and welcome to uh, my new podcast talking about some HTCG points. Today I'm joined by the creator of Astronomica, Aether. I like to go by the creator of Aetherborn, actually. I almost said that by accident. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So today we're talking about uh, keeping games competitive and just trying to create that kind of scene. So what do you think would be the first step in making your HTCG competitive? Simple. Don't try to. <laughs> nice. I think it's not a good idea to specifically create a game with the intention of it being super competitive and you have a tournament series all planned out in your head. I don't think that's going to help you out much. Like, when it comes to games like Magic, right, for example, it wasn't created with the intention of it being played competitively, you know? Uh, I think the first and foremost, your game does, and your main focus when developing the game should just be making it fun and making sure it works. The competitive aspect comes when you start attracting players and they start asking about, hey, now we should look into tournaments. Because if you don't have players, if you don't have a good game, you can't even really consider the competitive aspect of your game, you know? Yeah, for sure. Uh, it kind of reminds me, like, it also makes me wonder how much creating new sets you should. Because I understand, like, the point of trying to break a meta. Uh, but what do you think, because in my mind I feel like it could be better to let a meta break naturally. Uh, and using power creep in that kind of way. Because I've seen, like, obviously there are issues in creating your game to be competitive, like you said. But then I've also seen, like, some Chaos Galaxy videos where he'll be like, oh, this will be a great card in competitive because it does this. And it just kind of either ruins the meta, but not in a way of making the meta still playable. Or it just kind of becomes a useless card. So and I... I feel like I feel like creating a game with just competitiveness in mind and even your cards can be bad. I think it's a good thing to argue. The main thing you learn is that the cards you think are good usually tend not to be the best. Because when you when you make a game, right? And especially in this community when it's just one to two people, you can't play test every combination. So you'll always find like you'll be like oh this card's crazy it's good man like this is a card i think would see a lot of play and then it's not that it's a random common you've only looked at once <laughs> throughout the entirety of your set's development uh have you ran into that in your game at all because i know cards like infernal elemental is like looks like a boss card in terms of how it can gain tons of power and hit your opponent for two damage but i never see it played yeah, I think it's because sometimes the simplest effects can be the deadliest, and it's just that, especially when you make a game where some of the major features of it are so different, it's hard to really gauge what's so powerful, you know what I mean? Yeah. But in any game, you'd be like, yes, draw power, that's good, but like, like in Astronomica specifically, cards that reduce attack are very powerful because, you know... It's, uh, it's like a single-digit kind of game, so like reducing two attack, that's monumental. Especially since most units are in the same range. So, I had to pause for a drink there. <laughs> so, I find like, yeah, I did run into it because I'll be like, Inferno Elemental was a case of, this is a starter deck card, like, it wasn't designed to be bad, but, you know, I didn't think it was going to be extremely overpowered or anything, you know. But um, there have been cards where, like, like something like Future Sight Occultist, which is a really good card, uh, doesn't see as much play as, like, a common, like, Exoplanet Explorer, you know? Yeah. And there's things you don't really notice when you're designing cards by yourself. That's one thing, because Pillars has been in development for so long, it's helped me with that, with things like... Uh... I've noticed pretty much the best card in the game is an uncommon, 
has pretty bad stats called Novice Flame Mage, that's entire effect is just when it's destroyed, you get to add another uh, Azar faction unit from your discard to your hand. And it's way better than any of the cards I tried to make good. Yeah, it also seems to stem from, like, balancing issues like these. It's when, um, especially when you're making your first set and there is a lack of cards in your game, cards which interact with things a certain way even if it's like mediocre in any other context, when it's the only card that does it, it can be really good. Like in a game without that much, um, like a game without much removal, you know, cards that just reduce attack are going to be stronger. In a game where you can't interact with the discard pile much, a card which has a drawback to interact with it will still be really good because it's the only way you can do it, you know? Yeah. That kind of talk just reminds me of how I've always kind of thought and it, it's well known in your games that it's good to create more generic cards but I feel like that helps competitiveness anyways because like because uh, to me when you create like these rigid archetypes you you set your play styles of cards while like for example, I've noticed Astronomica does not have that many set archetypes in it. For the most part, the cards are just kind of there. And so that's how, like, Kira and I were able to create the Runefire deck. And it could be good, is because uh, we just found cards that happen to work well together and built a deck that on paper doesn't look very good. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um,. For me, with archetypes, archetypes are a personal pet peeve I kind of have in the HTCG community. Uh, I feel like a lot of people rush into them too quickly because I think once you start including very rigid Yu-Gi-Oh! style archetypes, you limit the design space for your game. Like, you know, Yu-Gi-Oh! had a period of time without archetypes, right? Like... There's a period where that didn't happen, and then it moved to archetypes. You can't go backwards. So when you start at archetypes, you cannot go backwards. The problem with an archetype is the cards are designed to synergize with each other very strongly. Very, it's very xenophobic because you know you have to have specific names. It's not like, it's not like a tribal deck where like oh there's a bunch of cards that will have, yeah they work with other cards in the type, but you know not every card with that type has to work with it. Then archetype everything has to work with each other, you know? That's how you have that unified theme. So, I personally tried to avoid having an archetype in my set one because I feel like it can be very restrictive. Uh, and this is also getting off topic, I feel. <laughs> Maybe from the competitive aspect. I don't know. I feel like having archetypes too early is trying to maybe, yeah, get it too competitive too quickly. I'm not sure. I'm not a huge fan of archetypes, I'll be honest. <laughs> yeah. Personally, in my game, I am creating... I'm trying to create, like, at least one archetype uh, per thing in it. Uh, but part of that is, like... I, I see what you're meaning, though, because to me, that's just how I've grown up playing games, is, like, having those options for you. Uh, but at the same time, it does limit what you can do because your archetype is going to be deck is going to be stronger than a non-archetype deck generally. Yeah. So that definitely can hurt you. I I personally am not going to go back on creating archetypes in my game. It could be a bad decision, but I mean, I don't think it's a bad decision and I'm going on a rant about them, but I have them in my second set, so <laughs> It's not to say that like it's just you have to make a conscious understanding like once you add archetypes you cannot go back to a purely generic kind of state you know what i mean yeah like it, there'll be a certain point where the game kind of evolves past the generic 40 good card 30 good card decks like i mean i, I think with chaos scouts you're right the first archetypes weren't that good competitively like the shields and lava beasts and the uh Zeta rays or whatever they weren't that yeah. good right 
Yeah, so, like, if your archetypes are, like, kept in line with everything else, then, I mean, they can be neat. It's, like, this is the same of cards that work together. They have similar art, similar style. And it can be, like, training wheels for someone who's new to the game. But, like, yeah, then eventually, no matter what, you will have an archetype in your game that is efficient to a point where I feel like it starts to devolve into an archetype, like, rush, you know? Yeah. It also reminds me, uh, frickin', I got, uh, I got a DM after playing in the Chaos Galaxy tournament, which I'll talk about more later, but I have a lot to say about that tournament, but they, uh... I don't um, condone his views on Chaos Galaxy. But, like, um, obviously, like, I enjoyed playing in the tournament, but I get this, um, I get this DM that's asking me... Uh, to look at the ban list for set four, uh, which like is not out yet, but like what could be the ban list moving into set four? And oh go, yeah, oh okay. that it's just, like sourcing it kind of community wide. Yeah, which right. I thought was yeah. great because that's been one of the biggest complaints about uh, Chaos Galaxy has been the game hasn't been taking a lot of community ban requests. So I thought that was great. Uh, hopefully, it is something that is looked at. I don't know all the details about it. But I went to look at it, and there are many cards that are overpowered in the game that I could not vote to limit or to ban just due to the fact that they would completely ruin an archetype. And I think that's something people don't tend to think about, is like the Night Jungle cards, there are two specific cards that make the archetype work. And you need to run two of them in the deck. I can't remember the name, so it's this blue lizard dude and then one of the trees. I think it's like Grook. Yeah. Um... And both of those were options to be banned. And I feel like that's my issue with ban list coming in, is you get these stronger cards, but if you ban them, you're completely ruining an entire archetype. But then if you keep them unbanned, they're still going to stay one of the most powerful decks in the game. Yeah, but I mean, that's just kind of the nature of archetypes. Um, they're always going to... The card that's like makes them good, like... You just have to get rid of them, usually. Uh, I don't really know if there's a better solution to the problem. You can say, oh, just don't make broken cards, but <laughs> easier said than done. Yeah, it, it's really but, weird. I have I just have an issue with ban lists in general. Like, I know, I know they're necessary, but at the yeah. same time, my... And I know you... Like you're saying, you can't just be like, oh, just don't make broken cards because we can't playtest these like other games. Like games that have like paid playtesters still have ban lists. <laughs> oh, good old Withers of the Coast. But then, but my issue is I feel like, at least in my opinion, we need to do everything we can to try to prevent ban lists when we're creating these like 100 card sets. Because I really I mean, think saying ban lists are inevitable at this stage, at least in my opinion, is not a true statement. Mm, ban lists are always inevitable. I don't think there's a way you can avoid having a ban list in your game unless you errata every card that's broken. And when you start errata in cards, it opens up a whole new can of forms. Yeah, but what I mean is, like, we create these one set at a time, but I've seen some yeah. creators, like, accept in their first set that they're going to have a ban list, when I feel like that is entirely avoidable. I think when we first create our games, we should definitely be able to try to limit having that and look at... Because 100 cards is a lot of cards, but not too much to test at least to the extent of breaking the game. I mean, I agree. Like, what you're saying, that there shouldn't be a ban list within the first set? Or, like... Yeah. I don't know, one of... I guess what I'm trying to say with it is, like, we don't know how many sets or games are going to get anyways. Yeah. So... I think it's better to like just try to do everything you can to avoid limiting it. 
Yeah, and I mean, I don't think most people would disagree with that. I mean, I one, one another pet peeve I have is games where it is a card type where it's inherently limited because, oh, these cards are so good. <laughs> I don't really like that type of style. Yeah. But, um... I don't, it's just it's hard I get it because sometimes it's like you you might preemptively nerf some or set something up like that but I guess what the word I'm looking for is it could just be that the card's really good right now but that's just because there's not enough cards built to directly like deal with it if that makes any sense so you don't want to change the effect right now but you understand it's too good like if you have a card of a card type where there's no removal for example in your first set right you might be like oh it's a really good card that's warping the game now but i don't want to change it too much because one card with a specific line of text and it's it's terrible you know it's like i don't know if i'm directly addressing what you're trying to say but it's like i can understand why people might leave certain effects that are controversial or very good as is because while we don't know how many um sets or games are going to have the intention is always that there's going to be more than one and you while you should be future proofing your game uh i don't know sometimes i get leaving things as is because they're not going to be that good once your next batch of cards roll around you know? Yeah. Uh, one game I would like to highlight right now just because they are they're currently in the creation of set 2 after having some tournaments would be Combo Masters. Uh, especially because I know a bit more about what's going on with set 2 and I'm not going to like throw any spoilers in but what I find interesting is Combo Masters since it doesn't have like requirements for cards so to speak uh, have They've ran into a lot of issues in uh, playtesting because yeah. there's so there's just so many possibilities. It's impossible to see them all. Yep, um, that's the other problem with uh, you know. What I was saying I don't. I'm not a huge fan of archetypes, but the reason why I think people tend towards them is because they can be easier to balance. It can be as simple as fixing a one single problem card, whereas when you do like a generic kind of game design where everything can interact with anything, you have to worry about a lot more. Yeah. So, like, that's why uh, that game in particular, like, the archetypes are necessary because otherwise the game just kind of really run. But, yeah. Um, for set two, um, it seems what they're planning on doing is, uh, like having cards that nerf certain types of cards that were really strong in set one um but then but still buffing every single play style and so like uh for example i play a uh, one turn kill in that game and so they're going to put they're talking about putting cards in that limit it or or try to stop uh one turn kill while at the same time adding cards in to buff the type which I think is an interesting approach that could work. Obviously, it's going to need a lot of playtesting, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, that... it depends on, I guess, how it's supposed to tackle it. I mean, I'm definitely not against cards which are designed to deal with problems from the previous set's uh, competitive impact, I should say. But it does depend on how well they're done. You don't want to, like, you make a card that's like completely shuts out a type and it's like no matter what you do to buff that type if one card shuts them out you know they're not going to be meta <laughs> ever yeah but so, that, but i like what i think is particularly good about them is they still plan on making those types stronger because yeah uh what what chaos galaxy has done because again like it's not two big sets and spread around so many different factions and the way zach has approached the game is kind of each set will highlight different factions which in turn you know boosts uh certain ones more than others which i get it's a good approach if you're not making a 300 card set you either have to make small adjustments to everyone or big adjustments to some 
and it's kind of just what ends up happening when you have more factions and types or whatever you know vanguard for example um has so many clans they can't put support for each clan in each set so one of the things they had to do in the reboot even they like made a roadmap of when each set was going to get support and said you know each clan will get support each year to bring things up you know yeah but my big problem with it is chaos galaxy uh like and i'm not particularly picky on the game it's just the most competitive htcg in terms of player base um because it's a lot bigger just have the 64 person tournament um and but the way the way that when they don't boost certain types it makes it so like i played borrow back when it was good because it was the easiest thing to play uh and that's all i know how to play so i ran that in the tournament even though it's not meta and yeah that ended up just killing me because um i mean like not necessarily i did lose to a borrow deck but at the same time there's so many times i almost lost just because uh in when they added zero support to the planet i just kept almost losing to cards that they didn't even have to be played well. They were just I mean, better didn't than my deck. Support in set three? Not that much. The the best I got was Pebble. <laughs> <laughs> like I seriously to to try to compete with people, I had to run really weird strategies while other people could run just a straightforward planet and do a lot better. Yeah, but again, I don't think that's a situation that can be easily fixed. The main problem there is, again, once there's so many deck types and so many styles or whatever, you can't give support to everything. Like, you know, not every set could have, like, weather mass support, for example. You know what I mean? Like, it's just the nature of any card game that's going to ebb and flow which cards, which decks are doing better and which decks get better tools. You yeah. Know? I just like, think it is, like, if you're, if you have a game like Combo Masters where there you can find a way to still boost each type, I think it definitely yeah, but That's works. what I'm saying. He, they, they're trying to boost each type, for example, right, with Combo Masters. But once it, when it releases, we'll see how much each type gets boosted. The difference between a type getting, oh, you know, every type could get support, right? But which type will be getting good support? Yeah, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, for sure. Definitely, definitely all depends on what happens. I I guess I just find that because like we both run faction based games, and that's one thing I've just been really worried about is, um, especially making it. Like, I guess one of the issues with Chaos Galaxy though might be that you can't really run double faction in that game as much as you can in others well in chaos galaxy i thought the um can't you mix cards from different planets i thought it was you, just that you like can interact with the planet card itself yeah you can mix but the problem is uh while the planet cards aren't great you run into issues of it just taking up space when you could be boosting your planet effect yeah, but I mean, I guess that's a trade-off of mixing cards in that game. Yeah. And then another thing I thought uh, was kind of weird um, for like trying to develop a competitive scene, because like as you said, it's probably not best to try to develop one. But at the same I, time, yeah, there's a certain point where you should try it, but it probably shouldn't be at the very start of your game <laughs> or like while you're still working at the details of yeah because some people try and start it way too early but at the same time like do you think it's important to try to be unique in your competitive setup to try to stand out or just try to go with something no. that's more like tried and true yeah there's no need to be unique <laughs> you're not gonna attract people who are like well i never saw i i never wanted to play pillars tcg but i don't know he's given out free stuff so <laughs> oh, you ruined <laughs> you know, my plan <laughs> you could have like this super unique awesome super detailed competitive scene but that's not going to bring in new players if they don't like the base game which is kind of what i was saying before 
Uh, I think it's better to just stick to a tried and true system. Maybe try and like innovate one or two things, but you know, overall, it's better to just try what's working. Yeah, I guess the only argument against that would be, like, what, like, should you try to highlight certain different appeals? Because, for example, like, uh, you run to the issue of why would someone play an Astronomica tournament over um, a Magic the Gathering tournament or a Yu-Gi-Oh tournament? Well, the idea there is that one game is Astronomica, the other is Yu-Gi-Oh, and the other is Magic. <laughs> you know? Like, I, as I was saying about focusing about your game, people will play your game if they like it, and they'll play in the tournaments if they like your game. Your game should be different enough to already sell the fact that it stands by itself. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I understand the issue, but it's like, if I wanted to play in a Yu-Gi-Oh tournament, I wouldn't be like, ooh, this Magic tournament sounds cool, I'm going to do that instead, because I don't like Magic, I like Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah, that's fair. Like, that's why I'm saying there's no huge need for tournaments to be super unique, because people will play the games they like to play, and having a tried and true tournament system means you don't run into as many issues as if you try to innovate with some crazy you know, quadruple elimination round robin sports. <laughs> Battle on the moon, galactic tournament. <laughs> yeah. I was just, it is weird to me. Obviously, there's the amount of players being an issue, but in general, would you say that the uh, HTCG scene is competitive or not? Because there's a lot of tournaments, but it, Chaos Galaxy being the exception, I've never seen a like decently sized one i mean i think it's just kind of because of the nature of the scene chaos galaxy had the benefit of being big enough that people organize the tournaments themselves and you know chaos galaxy is a big enough game to get people just playing because you know no prize support like you look at other big games in a community like wrath of course he didn't look into doing tournaments until recently because von tap for example uh, I don't think Domhan or, like, Skyscape just now got his cards onto Untap. I mean, it's just, it's good, the community's small. So I think you could say that most people, players at least in a community, would like the, like the competitive aspects of card games. But the reason Chaos Galaxy is only off the tournaments right now is because they started early and they have a big enough audience to support it. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. To me, I feel like it also... I think there's also issues of... Um, like, obviously, we all we all like trading card games. But then you run into the issue of uh, how many people enjoy playing games competitively versus just making them. Yeah. Because, like, there's, like, people like me and Kiro that, like, the second there's a tournament for about any game we want to learn it and play it just for the sake of uh learning a new game to be competitive in but mm -hmm. then there's a bunch of people that like and it's completely fine but their purpose is solely to uh develop their game and they don't really yeah. care what happens otherwise that's kind of me to be honest <laughs> yeah i mean it's just the nature of the community yeah yeah, I just it's just interesting to me trying to because it over here Chaos Galaxy is about the only exception I've seen of getting of your players not also be creators themselves. Oh, like getting players who aren't making card games. Yeah. Yeah, I mean again, it's part of the um the power of having that much reach cuz most homemade trading card games, right? They start out on Instagram or they start out on Discord and most of the people they follow or most of the people they try to get interested are other creators. Like, I feel like that's also a reason why there's an issue of it because you get your other creators to look into your game to support it and you know, some people will, that's fine, but your other creators might not have the time to play your game competitively. You get what I mean? Yeah. Because, you know, we're all trying to create our own stuff. Yeah. And, yeah, as I said, you know, most games start out on 
either the main Discord server or on Instagram. So you are mainly targeting and getting started by other creators. Now, once you go to YouTube, I think you get a better look at people who aren't trying to make their own game. But also part of the problem is when you advertise that your game's homemade, you're going to make people who don't have a game look into it, look into the process of making a game. That's just part of the community, you know? Yeah. So it's interesting. Uh, Chaos Galaxy just had a lot of people who don't make games because of the exposure and the size, you know? So larger sample size. Yeah, for sure. Uh, are there anything, any last things you want to say, or are you good to end? Uh, not really. Astronautica is on sale right now. Yep, be sure to check it out. Uh, very fun game. And don't you have plans for tournaments coming up? Yep, join the Discord in the description because I know there will be a link in the description. <laughs> is that a threat? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a threat to promise. <laughs> All right. And you know, try out the game. Yep. Uh, thank everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.